Facebook. <laughs> My name is Chantel Hazelwood. I'm an audiologist here at Swedish. I am delighted to be here today with my colleague um, to talk to you about um, your questions and topics related to our field, audiology. Um, we are really passionate about this topic, of course. Um, hearing loss impacts so many people in our country and in our world. Um, it has a huge impact on our ability to communicate and socialize and take care of all of the things that we need to take care of. So we're excited to be here to talk to you today. I'm Liz Elkins, I'm also an audiologist at Swedish, and like Chantel said, we're thrilled to hear your questions about all things audiology, hearing loss, tinnitus, and we hope we can give you some great information today. Awesome, well thank you both so much for joining us, and it seems like our audience is excited to ask you questions Yay. too, because we already have some, so let's just jump right in. So first question. I pass every hearing test I am given, but I still can't hear for beans. What's up with that? <laughs> it's a really great question and uh, one that we encounter pretty frequently in our mm -hmm. clinic. Um, there can be a lot of different reasons why you might be experiencing difficulty hearing um, in certain situations and yet might pass an audiology test. Um, the audiology test, a lot of it is related to detection of soft sounds, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't always tell us the best information about what's going on in your own particular environment or in your communication um, environment or in, with your needs. Um, so um, some of the things that can we like to think about when people report this type of difficulty are what is the environment like? So when are you having trouble? Is it when you're in a meeting or um, when you're in an environment with background noise mm -hmm. and kind of taking stock in where we might be able to help you improve your communication, even if you're technically have normal hearing. What do you yes. think? Um, absolutely. Environment it has a huge impact um, because even if you have normal hearing, a lot of background noise is going to be very challenging. Um, another thing that we're all guilty of sometimes is having poor communication strategies, as we like to call them. Um, Sometimes we try and talk to each other from across the house or we try and talk to one another when um, we don't have one another's attention. Um, those can be problematic and cause communication breakdowns and make us think we're not hearing well when really we're just not tuned in to the other person or mm -hmm. we're not close enough or in an environment that allows us to hear them well. So we often recommend getting in the same room with others making sure that background noise is to a minimum as much as you can control, and just making sure that you get one another's attention. So I would say, hey, Chantel, I wanna to talk to you about this, and then start the conversation, mm -hmm. making sure that you know we're both focusing, mm -hmm. that's important. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you both. So I just wanna remind everyone that's tuned in, if you have any questions for the experts, you can submit them in the comments section or through private message. So let's move on to our next question. My father has considerable hearing loss and is in need of new hearing aids, but the cost prevents him from doing that. Mm -hmm. Are there resources available to help those on fixed incomes and Medicare? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another really common um, thing to come up. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about? Yeah, so, um, you know, he hearing aids certainly have a cost, and um, depending on income or your insurance, you may not have the coverage. And so what we've put together at our clinic is a list of resources. It's a resource guide for individuals on fixed incomes or with limited incomes who could use some hearing aid assistance. So if that is of interest to you, we would invite you to reach out to our clinic for a consultation or a conversation to uh, learn about the resources out in the Seattle community and greater Washington as well, because there definitely are resources out there for um, getting hearing aids, which mm -hmm. um, we're happy to share, um, because it's important to us that people can hear as best as they can. Great, thank you. So we'll move on to our next question. Um, I hear ringing all the time, mm -hmm. only when I sleep is when I don't experience ringing. What is the cause of this? Yeah, so mm -hmm. that is um, called tinnitus or tinnitus, um, mm -hmm. and that basically just means that you are perceiving or hearing a sound um, in your head or in your ears that's not present in the environment. Um, it's a very common condition, and while we don't know exactly what causes it, 
Um, it's associated with a number of different hearing related issues like noise exposure and hearing loss um, mm -hmm. can certainly be factors that are related to ringing in the ears. And people describe the sound as very different things. So yep. it's commonly called ringing. Um, some people will say it's like a buzzing or hissing. Mm -hmm. um, lots of different descriptions of it. Crickets. Crickets, <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of that um, symptom, the first thing that we recommend is that you have your hearing evaluated to see if you do have a hearing problem um, that could be um, partly to, to blame for the ringing in the ears. Um, in terms of man management strategies, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so um, tinnitus or tinnitus can be stressful, so managing it in different ways can be really helpful. Um, one thing people incorporate is a bedside masking machine or some sort of background noise, soft background noise at bedtime to help keep it from distracting you from sleeping. Um, because certainly less uh, sleep and fatigue can cause more stress and potentially worsening tinnitus. So um, keeping you know bedtime stress free and calm and relaxing with some soft noise can be really helpful. Um, and you know other things um, like fans, fountains, mm -hmm. those can be helpful too. Mm -hmm. um, anything that can help kind of break that stress loop that can be associated with hearing tinnitus um, can really help make it less bothersome. So another example of breaking the stress loop would be the uh, calming activity like going for a walk or doing something mm -hmm. to get your mind off of it and just de-stress. That can really help um, distract from the ringing. Mm -hmm. And along with what Chantel was saying about getting your hearing tested, some people actually um, have relief from tinnitus if they have a diagnosed hearing loss and then get treatment like with hearing aids that can sometimes make tinnitus less bothersome when you incorporate something like that. So mm -hmm. that's another reason why getting your hearing tested can be really helpful. Yeah, and as Elizabeth or Liz mentioned, um, sometimes there is this stress loop that can develop with tinnitus. So the more you think about it, the more you pay attention yeah. to it, um, oftentimes the worse the tinnitus will be. Um, so it's kind of like if you walk into a dark room and there's one candle in the room, that's really all that you're gonna be able to pay attention and focus to. And if your tinnitus is that primary focus in your life, then it will be like that. So distracting yourself or having noise in your background life, um, whether mm -hmm. that's music or white noise or whatever it might be, calming activities, things like that can help relieve it. Great tips, thank you. So another question from Tammy. My teens don't seem to ever take out their earbuds. Can you talk a little bit about how loud is too loud or recommendations on keeping their hearing healthy? Mm -hmm. um, so many patients, um, as they get older, will come in and talk about the noise exposure that they had when they were in their youth. Mm -hmm. And they will say, man, I wish I would have listened to my mom when she <laughs> told me. Um, or I wish I would have known when I was younger. So this is definitely very important to think about um, in our day-to-day -day lives. We are um, getting to be more and more um, prevalent, there's more and more prevalence in using headphones, yeah. a considerable amount of our, our daily life. Yeah. Um, so in terms of volume of headphones, there are a couple of tips that we recommend. Um, one can be to um, what I like to tell people is to find a quiet place in your environment and set your volume on your personal listening device to a comfortable but not loud level. And then the trick is try not to exceed that level when you go into somewhere that's noisy. Because we all have a tendency to you know, have our music on and then head to the bus and get on the bus. And the bus is noisy, so we turn the volume up and then pretty soon we're listening at unsafe levels and that level may stay at that level for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. um, what tips do you have? Um, certainly with headphone use, especially in noisy places, if possible, noise canceling headphones can be helpful to keep you from turning things up because you don't have to beat out the noise with those type of headphones, so that can be helpful. But for just general headphone use, um, I like to tell people, especially our teens, um, if other people can hear the music from your headphones when they're in your ears, it's definitely too loud. You don't want to be able mm -hmm. to share your music with others when you're using headphones. Um, that's too much. Um, and then another thing that with a, um, a lot of devices you can do is go into settings and limit your maximum volume 
control to be less than the max. So even when you're turning it all the way up, maybe you've set it to only really turn up 65% or something like that. So kind of changing the settings in your device to mm -hmm. avoid blasting yeah. the volume can be helpful um, so you don't just kind of do it reflexively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it's important, especially for young people, to know that these um, changes that can occur to your hearing are lifelong changes. So mm -hmm. we're born with the, um, the sensory organs that we're going to have for our hearing, um, and we don't get them back. So if they're damaged, they're gone. And over time, that can lead to accumulation of hearing loss. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way that we can prevent hearing loss is just protection from noise. So it's really, really important. There's definitely more research coming out to say that um, hearing loss is starting to develop younger and younger in teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, there was a really interesting study recently where they saw um, higher incidence of um, hearing loss just in one ear in teenagers. Mm -hmm. And they think it's because teenagers often share earbuds. Oh. Um, and when you share an earbud, you're turning the volume up to get more sound, mm -hmm. and then pretty soon you're damaging that ear that you share with your friend. So definitely important to be um, looking at this and thinking about this and educating your kids about this. Yeah, wow, that it's not reversible too. Mm -mm. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. scary. So another question that we have, are there home tests that you can do to determine whether you have a hearing issue or mm -hmm. might be developing one? Mm, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, there aren't really any, no, I don't know of any accurate home tests, um, but there are some questionnaires that are really good um, mm -hmm. for looking at signs yeah. of hearing loss. Um, yeah, there's certainly probably some tests out there on the internet and things, but the problem with those is the conditions when you come into the audiologist's office to get your hearing tested, you're doing that in a sound treated booth um, mm -hmm. with calibrated equipment. So, um, you know, while something available on an app or the internet might give you a ballpark or give you an idea of whether or not you have a hearing problem, getting an accurate, clear result might be tricky in that regard. Mm -hmm. So, definitely, if you have hearing concerns, we'd recommend getting a formal hearing evaluation in the appropriate conditions. Yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So another question, can hearing loss lead to dizziness or disorientation? Mm, I'm going to let you take this one. That is a really great question. Um, in terms of hearing loss leading to dizziness or uh, disorientation or being kind of a causative factor, um, I don't know that um, I can speak to that as much as that there are balance disorders that can cause both hearing loss and balance problems simultaneously. So um, there's certainly speculation out there that uh, certain types of hearing problems can make you feel off, um, which I could totally understand. Um, but what happens more often and what we see more often is certain types of balance disorders or diseases that not only cause vertigo or dizziness, but also have a hearing loss associated. Um, so if you come to Swedish to get your balance evaluated, there's a good chance you'd also get a hearing test mm -hmm. because the hearing test can give us hints about which ear could be a problem ear for your balance or what type of um, balance problem you might have. Um, balance takes into account our inner ears. Um, we have inner ears of hearing and balance. Mm -hmm. They're all chunked together. So the, our balance ears, our proprioception, which is just our orientation of our body in space, and our vision. So. Um, certainly an inner ear evaluation will be a big part of evaluating mm -hmm. a balance problem. And so we can see how your balance ears are doing as well as your hearing ears to get a clear answer. Great, thank you. So we have another question. My nephew has a speech delay. Mm -hmm. Why did he have to get a hearing test mm -hmm. when he was first diagnosed? His issue was with his talking and not his ears. Yeah. That's a great question. That's a really That's great question. We love that question. We love that question. <laughs> um, so the reason that your nephew had to get a hearing evaluation um, is that we have to be able to hear the sounds in our spoken language in order to be able to produce them. So you have to be able to hear a s sound in order to make an S sound. Um, so the first step in assessing a speech delay is making sure that a child has adequate access to all of the sounds in the English language or in our language. 
Um, so that's why. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Absolutely. Add? No. Um, we certainly see patients um, often for um, speech and language delays and speech concerns in our clinic. And that's why we like this question because we love to see kids too. Um, and it's kind of just a part of the puzzle as to why there might be a mm -hmm. speech or language delay because hearing is very important for the development of speech. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. So another question, can hearing loss cause early dementia? Mm. That's Good a great question. question. Um, <laughs> we were just talking about this uh, yeah. this morning. Yeah. There is some research that has come out that has um, indicated there could be a relationship between um, cognitive decline and um, untreated hearing loss. So people that um, have hearing loss and they're not wearing hearing aids um, potentially have a higher risk of cognitive decline mm -hmm. than individuals who don't have hearing loss or who have treated hearing loss. However, these studies are still pretty early and we don't necessarily know why or what it means. Um, and we also don't know if then um, wearing hearing aids later on would reverse the impact of the cognitive issue. So some of the theories as to the why um, could be that um, it could either be actually related to the hearing loss, yep. it could potentially be related to the social impact that hearing loss has on an individual. Mm -hmm. So people that have um, undiagnosed or untreated hearing loss tend to kind of self-isolate. Mm -hmm. So situations that used to be enjoyable may not be as enjoyable because they're struggling understanding the people around them. Um, so that might be related, but the underlying why is still an unknown factor. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for answering mm -hmm. that question. So next question, how often should I be getting hearing tests? And I assume this would be different for children versus adults. Mm -hmm. Can you speak Definitely. to that please? Absolutely. Should we talk about children or adults first? Just children. Yeah, so um, children um, should all receive a hearing screening at birth. Um, that's pretty common in hospital settings, but if you go to a birthing center or another type of center, um, they might refer you to a clinic like ours for mm -hmm. a hearing screening or they might do it in-house. Um, after that, um, we recommend children come in for hearing evaluations if there are speech and language concerns like we talked about or hearing concerns. Mm -hmm. Another um, reason to get a hearing test would be frequent ear infections, um, mm -hmm. which can happen especially kind of in the toddler ages or mm -hmm. infant ages. So um, after that, children should receive hearing screenings every year starting at age four um, until the age of 21. So that is the current uh, pediatric or child recommendations mm -hmm. that we have. Yep. And they might get that hearing screening either at their primary care doctor's office mm -hmm. or at school, yep. or maybe both. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's fine too. Yeah. Um, once people reach adulthood, mm -hmm. um, there's not really great data yet to give us guidelines, um, but the general recommendation is about once every 10 years mm -hmm. um, as we're younger, and then once we get to be about the age of 50, yep. um, more frequently. And the more frequently part is still a little bit of a hazy area. Yeah. Um, but this might be as simple as a screening in your primary care doctor's office um, or a questionnaire that you could answer to see if there's a suspicion that something might be going on with the hearing. Yeah. What do you think? I think um, in regards to getting hearing screenings and hearing tests, if there's ever a concern, whether it's mm -hmm. for yourself, your child, or your relative, certainly bringing it up. To pri your primary care physician is a great start mm -hmm. towards getting referred on for a hearing evaluation. So yep. always raise your concerns. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So another question, um, is deafness a byproduct of certain diseases? Hmm. It can be, yep. it can be. Mm -hmm. So um, hearing loss um, is associated with some very common um, medical conditions. Um, so people that have diabetes um, or cardiovascular issues have a higher rate of experiencing hearing loss. Mm -hmm. um, there are other more specific medical conditions that um, can have hearing loss as um, part of that condition. Yeah. And then there are certainly other types of genetic um, characteristics that some people have that can make them more prone to hearing loss 
or um, have cause them to be born with hearing loss because of their genetic makeup. So sometimes that's in the form of a specific genetic profile or something that's never known. But there um, certainly are, like Chantal said, specific diagnoses that can um, relate with hearing loss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So another question that came in from Colette, can plane flights or wearing earbuds cause tinnitus to get worse, mm -hmm. permanently or temporarily? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Yeah. Do you wanna? Well, I was just going to say, um, plane, uh, with plane flights, um, they can be noisy, mm -hmm. but what, do you think that they're at a level that you would expect permanent tinnitus? Um. I think if you were wearing earbuds mm -hmm. on the plane mm -hmm. and you were cranking your music or movie because of how mm -hmm. noisy the plane is, mm -hmm. that could definitely give you some ringing afterwards. Mm -hmm. And you know, depending on the duration, our hope would be that that would kind of resolve itself. But certainly if you have prolonged noise exposure, whether it's from music listening or um, working eight hours a day in an industrial workplace, that can cause permanent issues. Yeah. But the I, the scenario that comes to my mind is trying to watch a movie on a plane and trying to beat out the sound of the mm -hmm. engines. It, mm -hmm. it definitely is tempting to crank crank the yeah. sound up, which yeah. yeah, I would expect a little ringing. Yeah. From that. The other thing that can happen on flights, as we all know, is that you experience pressure changes, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, sometimes when the pressure in your ear changes the kind of quality or uh, perception of your tinnitus might shift yeah. because of that pressure change. So again, I would anticipate that would be more of a temporary change to the tinnitus. If you're somebody that experiences tinnitus already and you get on a flight, it may change um, based on just pressure, but yeah, hopefully that piece pronounced. of it would yeah. resolve after that pressure resolved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So another question, I've had two surgeries on my right ear and I can't hear from my right ear at all. Mm -hmm. Does this affect my brain? Mm -hmm. Well, um, not necessarily, um, only in the way that uh, you might be able to localize sound, so your brain utilizes the sound from both ears mm -hmm. um, to localize. Yeah. So typically the brain would have a harder time in localizing sound if you don't have any hearing in one ear, you have poorer hearing in one ear. Yeah, background noise, like Chantel said, can be especially challenging too. Um, because that's another one of those brain functions that is what we call binaural or using information from both ears to suppress background noise naturally. Mm -hmm. So when the ears are really different, that, that task for the brain is very challenging because the cues just, they're not, they're not accurate mm -hmm. from the ears. They're not, the ears aren't even anymore. So mm -hmm. it can be problematic in that regard. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's, um, is speculated to happen is your brain might reorganize a little bit from having mm -hmm. no sound on one side. It might decide, oh, I'm going to use this part of my brain to do something a little different. And um, that's a pretty nebulous topic, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily for the worse. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thank you. So that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I wanna take this opportunity as we're getting close to the end of time here to, for everyone to get in their questions. And if the doctors can't get to them, we'll get to them after the Facebook mm -hmm. Live. Mm -hmm. But let's move on to some other questions that we have. Okay. What can someone expect from a first visit at the clinic? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So um, you would come in and the first thing is just talk to you a lot about what's going on with your hearing. We'd ask a full history um, questionnaire just to get an idea of your general health mm -hmm. and any symptoms that you might be experiencing related to hearing or balance or tinnitus. Mm -hmm. Um, then you, we would take a look in your ears to make sure that your ears are clear of wax so that we can proceed with testing. And then our general audiology tests um, relate to how you are able to detect soft sounds of different tones. So some tones will be low tones and some tones will be high pitched tones. Um, and then we do some speech tests. Do you want to talk about the speech test? Yeah, the first speech test we like to do is play words uh, softer and softer and see what's the softest word that you can detect or discriminate. Um, that helps us just kind of cross check our uh, beeping test results, our tone results. And then we also play um, some additional speech testing at a louder volume to see um, how well you can understand those words. So whether or not you have hearing loss, um, sometimes the information can come in at a loud enough volume, but it might not be very clear. So that's something we like to verify as well. 
-hmm. And then depending on the rest of the results, there are other specialty tests that we might run to see um, if you're having any problems with your um, middle ear or eardrum mm -hmm. um, and some things like that to kind of determine if you're having hearing loss, what the source of that hearing loss is. Yeah. Great. And the picture looks a little different for uh, children. We do a lot of similar mm -hmm. procedures, but um, depending on the age of the child, we might do a different type of test um, to get what we call behavioral information or responses to different sounds. Mm -hmm. So for little ones, we might play a sound and then reinforce attending to the sound with like a toy or a video. Um, little bigger kids, we might play a game and um, perform an action like putting a toy in a bucket when we hear a sound. So mm -hmm. we have different um, types of testing for all of the different ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. So another question that we have, are custom make earplugs more beneficial than generic for music or mm -hmm. concerts? That's a it good question. can be. Mm -hmm. um, generic earplugs work quite well mm -hmm. if they're put into the ear correctly. Um, but what we know is that the lab tests and um, the reliability of a, a non-custom earplug can vary widely um, amongst the population. Um, so if you are somebody that um, knows how to put in your earplugs correctly, then you're getting a maximum benefit. Um, for other people, um, a custom earplug might be more beneficial because there's only one correct way to put it in. Um, and it's easier for people to know that it is incorrectly, it's seated correctly. Yeah. Um, and so they might provide um, a little bit more benefit. And then do you want to speak to musicians plugs? Yeah, so musicians plugs are one type of um, custom plug that we have that um, some people who are heavy concert goers or musicians really like because they a, what's called attenuate or make things softer, but they also preserve the sound quality better than a solid plug would because there are different filters to reduce the level of the sound without messing too much with the 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 different tones and frequencies and pitches of the music. So um, that is something that we can make in our office and in other audiology clinics. Um, I also wanted to piggyback about the non-custom foam plugs. One kind of um, good trick is if you look in the mirror, can you see the plug sticking out? If you can, it's probably not deep enough. Mm -hmm. um, for them to be effective, the insertion depth, um, how deep you get it in the ear canal is really what's most important. So if you can get it in where you can't see it when you look face on in the mirror, then um, they're going to do a much better job. Mm -hmm. Great, good tips, thank you. So our last question of the day, I have single-sided deafness due to an acoustic neuroma mm -hmm. removal. Mm -hmm. Is there any hope uh, to regain my hearing on the one side except with a BAHA? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, this is also kind of a newer area of research. Um, Bajas or BAHAs are um, bone conduction devices that sit on the side of hearing loss. And um, there's also a non-surgical option called a cross system, which is like two sets, it's like wearing two hearing aids, only it functions a bit differently. Um, these different devices are all under the umbrella of cross systems. Uh, basically, they take sound from the side that has deafness and reroutes it over to the normal hearing side or the side with better hearing. Yeah. And, and the, for an acoustic neuroma yeah. case, that would probably be... The best option. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the the tricky thing about these devices is you're not putting sound into that side. So those binaural functions we talked about earlier, like localizing mm -hmm. and listening and noise, can still be challenging. Um, but also you're getting sound awareness with those kind of devices mm -hmm. to the side that you're not hearing as well. So what we recommend for our patients is to take that sound awareness and use your other senses like vision to really help yourself orient mm -hmm. to where sound is coming from. Mm -hmm. And then always remember that your normal hearing ear is gonna do the best job. So mm -hmm. can, if you can get your um, normal hearing ear close to what you're interested in, that's going to help. And all of the other communication strategies are really important for this population too. Yeah. Um, just to um, maximize the environment, make it as best as, as it can be mm -hmm. to hear as well as it can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we have a couple of um, handouts that we like to give to our um, patients in clinic about communication strategies. And mm -hmm. um, we have a handout about tinnitus and um, we'll be posting that um, later on today. Yeah. Great, thank you. So we're at just about time. So is there anything else that either of you wanted to drive home for our audience that's tuned in today? Mm -hmm. 
I think that um, just being aware of hearing health mm -hmm. and um, hearing hygiene um, is the message that we really want to drive home, making people aware that hearing loss can impact anybody. You don't have to be an older adult yeah. um, to experience hearing loss or to experience the effects of noise. Yeah. Um, so um, be mindful of what you're listening to and protect your hearing when you can. Yeah. And I think the other thing is Piggybacking on that, like because it can happen at all ages, um, don't be afraid um, to advocate for yourself in, li in difficult listening mm -hmm. situations. If you do have a hearing loss, don't be afraid to ask for repetition or, or make your environment better mm -hmm. or speak up if you feel like you're not hearing as well as you could be. Um, we work, like Chantal said, with people from birth, you know, through the lifespan with hearing loss. So, you know, having a hearing problem doesn't you know, I mean, you can't, you know, advocate for yourself and and communicate as best as possible. Yeah, great. Thank you both so much for all the information you've provided today. And thank you to everyone that tuned in today. And make sure you keep an eye out for our next Facebook Live. And one more thing, our um, Facebook Live will be reposted with captioning. So if you missed it today, um, feel free to watch the